we have um, we have been teaching a series on fasting and revival, I believe, and uh, so we continue the third message on that. And uh, uh, I'll be finishing off all the uh, panorama of uh, the Bible people that uh, Pastor David has uh, uh, been given uh, when he was in Madaba, and uh, by tomorrow. And so then, uh, together with him, uh, because he's leaving on a Monday, uh, we will finalize some things. And then, uh, from the next Friday onwards, as a spirit lead, always put as a spirit lead, uh, uh, if the spirit permits and allows us, then I'll start teaching on uh, the revelations that were given uh, to Pastor David uh, of the Bible people. From Noah, I believe, right up to Zechariah, but the main figures are Noah right up to uh, Daniel. So I'll be using the all night series uh, to teach a little on that. So uh, at first I was thinking of doing it on the other meetings, but I felt that all night is the appropriate place because this is a precious thing that the Lord has. And those who come to pay the price to spend time with God, I believe that's the right platform for that. And so tonight we want to continue to encourage each one of us to press on in what God is doing. We have always again imagined that what the revival will be like when the revival comes. And um, we have always imagined that there will always be a group of people praying or waiting on God. And then uh, suddenly God's presence show up. And then uh, it can come in several ways. And the uh, presence of God comes with a group of people or several groups of people. And then those group of people will go forth and share with others. All people begin to visit where the presence of God is manifested. And then slowly the whole world is touched. It has happened in many other revivals, including Azusa Street Revival. And, uh, and then that's how we imagine that it will spread. But none of us have ever imagined that before this great revival, we know that before Jesus comes again, there will be a great revival. But none of us have ever imagined that before this great revival, that God would send His angels, uh, He has sent His Holy Spirit, but He sent His angels to instruct us to prepare for the revival. And it's going to take us one to two years to prepare for this revival. No one, no, none of us could have imagined that. And... Uh, because we, every everyone will say, hey, you know, what's there to prepare? Oh, you just, uh, if you're not prepared, repent, and then uh, that's it, and uh, and you're prepared. But it seems that what God is preparing us for is a move and a and a manifestation of God that no other revival has ever had before. In church history, you will never read about how archangels or angels manifest to people and tell them the, to prepare for what God wants to do in one to two years time. It will never happen in the whole of history. And so this is the first time that it's happening in church history and uh, you're living that history and we are seeking to obey as much as we can. And why this preparation? What, what's so special about what God is about to do? I believe that God is about to bring a special presence on the earth. Like what he brought when uh, Pastor David went to the seven churches. He had a spiritual uh, breakthrough at uh, Pergamos where the glory of God filled the entire mountain and, um, at the Acropolis there. And, uh, and, and it was visible in the spiritual realm, which I'm sure if anyone was there in the natural, they might have the side effect of that. And it flowed throughout the whole earth to a certain extent. That glory is supposed to come on the whole planet. And it's God's intention that that glory will be even more intense as it comes upon the whole planet. And whether the whole planet is ready or not, and that's the part where this one, two year preparation is. But wherever the people of God are prepared, this is what God wants to do and prepare us for. As we all know, there are nine different categories of angels and, um, and uh, spirit beings, for lack of a better word, you can call them all angels you want, where there are three groupings. The... First grouping carry the presence of God. Second grouping covered carry the governments of God. And the third grouping, the works of God. 
Uh, the first grouping carrying the presence of God are the group called seraphim, cherubim and thrones. And uh, we have given you all the scriptures in our teaching. The middle grouping are those that are the dominions or lords and uh, powers and authorities. And uh, Greek word are kuriates and exousias and dunamis. And uh, then the second group are the arche, the archangels and the angels. That's the carrying out the works of God. I believe that it is the destiny of the last day church. The church that will be the bride of Jesus Christ. The church that will welcome Jesus back in His second coming that I believe is the destiny of the last day church to carry the presence of God as great if not even greater than the presence that was on the tabernacle of Moses than the presence that was on the temple of Solomon. And if you look at it, the whole Old Testament revolve around the presence of God coming to His people. From the time that the presence of God was lost in the Garden of Eden, and men had to come to God's presence through uh, altar sacrifice and through the blood, which later became fulfilled in Jesus in the blood covenant, God has been seeking to bring His presence to people. But He begins to teach us how this presence cannot be taken lightly. And people have to be prepared for this presence. And thus, when He revealed Himself, and I believe that is a revelation that is given to us, that all the preparations that are being done in these one, two years under the instruction of the archangels that God has sent to be in our midst, and of all the archangels that He sent, they are the same archangels including the ones that are named in the Bible like Gabriel and Michael who has visited us here. But these are the archangels who have been involved whenever the people of God in the Bible became the center of gravity of what God was doing. In the life of Abraham, in the life of Noah, in the life of Moses, in the life of David, and in every other life where it was a center of gravity of what God was doing on the planet Earth. And here, God is doing it all over again. Sending the same general angels, the same archangels, and giving the instruction to the Holy Spirit to tell us how to prepare for that which He is wanting to do. And it's not completed yet. Uh, Pastor David, we got a lot more places to go, and we got a lot more prayer to go also. And uh, a, lot more a lot more fasting. Thank you very much. It's good news for some of you. And uh, so, a lot more that we are preparing ourselves in. But let's, let's take a step back and look at what God is telling us. And He's giving us a little bit of revelation at a time, which I'd like to point to you what is at the ending. And so, in the book of uh, Exodus, when God spoke to Moses, you notice that when He spoke to His people through Moses, and later it was through Aaron too, Aaron was one, uh, used by God under Moses' request, the first thing God did in the book of Exodus chapter 3, as uh, He remembered them, He remembered the covenant He has made in chapter 2 verse 24, and then in chapter 3, He appeared to Moses, and uh, this is what he told, told them, uh, told Moses in chapter 3, verse 6 and 7, Exodus. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. So God was showing his glory. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. And I heard their cry, because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So, I have come to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hevites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, 
Behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. He did tell them that he will bring them out of Egypt into the promised land that he has spoken to Abraham. But there was one thing God didn't mention yet about how he was going to dwell in their midst. And as in the end, after a little bit of delay, Moses went forth and, um, to Egypt. And then as uh, he went forth to Egypt, you notice that each time as he confront uh, Pharaoh, a little bit more revelation is given each time. It's almost like, like even Moses himself was not 100% sure of all that God was going to reveal. He only knew some parts. And of course for the people, all they want is to be free. Seemingly. Later when they were free, it seems they want other things too. But uh, uh, they, they, want to, they, they, they want to be relieved of this oppression. So in chapter 5, in the encounter with uh, Pharaoh, says here in verse 2, uh, verse 1, Moses says, Thus says the Lord God, let my people go, and notice the reason he gave, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Hey, Moses didn't tell Pharaoh that once they leave, they're not coming back. He just said, let the people go, God wants them to hold a feast for him. Now, God might have told him a lot of things, but notice that the knowledge of what was going to happen was given to them a little bit at a time. None of them knew they're going to be in the wilderness building the tabernacle and that God is going to put his presence there. All these details, maybe Moses would have a glimpse, but not everyone knew what was going on. It's the same like God has manifest in our midst, God has given instructions as to what to do, and we are getting dribbles and bits and pieces, and we need to see the overall picture so that we can gather together and march forward and understand what God is leading us to do. And uh, so, of course, Pharaoh refused uh, to yield. And uh, Moses got a bit discouraged because he thought that everything would happen uh, immediately at the end of chapter 5. He complained a bit to God. And uh, then God tells him that uh, he will deliver them. In, he delivered them by a strong hand. God re uh, reminded them again uh, of all that he wants to do. And uh, so we have here that God sent him back uh, to Pharaoh in chapter 7. And the first plague began, it says here in verse uh, 14, Exodus 7 verse 14. So the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hard. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning. When he goes out to the water, you shall stand by the river bank to meet him, and the rod which was turned to a serpent, you shall take it in your hand. And you shall say this to him. Notice what he's now going to say. The Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me to you, saying, let my people go. That always understood is mentioned all the time. Say, but you know, notice it says, that they may serve me in the wilderness. And that's a little bit more. Now, the people are going to do something for God. And it's a little bit different now. At first it was, let my people go, they're going to have a feast up there with their God. Now, let my people go, they're going to serve me there. It's like God slowly re re revealing His plan a little bit at a time, uh, what, what it entails. And of course, uh, uh, He didn't let them go. <clears throat> and um, so one plague followed the other. And, uh, <clears throat> and as He continued confronting with Pharaoh, we uh, jump over a few uh, places here. In uh, chapter... 8 verse 20 The Lord says Rise early in the morning Stand before Pharaoh As he comes out of the water 
comes up to the water, then say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. Now, there he's emphasizing serving him again. Uh, this is up to the fourth plague that uh, was given. But again, um, Pharaoh refused. And uh, then in the end, Pharaoh said, after when, when all these flies start coming, in verse 24, look at what Pharaoh says in verse 25. Pharaoh called to Moses and Aaron, after the flies was all over the place, he said, go, he said, go, sacrifice to your God in the land. You know this, Pharaoh says, yes, you can go and sacrifice. Some of you might not know this, that the Pharaoh just said, yeah, you can go and sacrifice. But look, Moses says in verse 26, uh, sacrifice to God in this land. Don't go there, but sacrifice here. So, a little bit yielding. Then Moses says in verse 26, it is not right to do so. Moses said, that's not good enough, he says. It's not right. If we could sacrifice things that are abomination to the Egyptians, and uh, then they were stoned us. Then in verse 27, Moses said, we will go three days journey into the wilderness, sacrifice to the Lord our God as He will command us. And then Pharaoh said, I will let you go, that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you shall not go very far away. Then he says, pray for me. It is Pharaoh, a funny guy. Right, he's against all the time, and then they're like, okay, okay, I'll let you go. Don't go too far, and uh, pray for me. You know, like he's really in trouble. And um, then Moses, he prayed, and all the flies uh, went off. But Pharaoh was lying in verse twenty-nine. But Pharaoh, uh, but let Pharaoh not do deceitfully anymore. So Moses said. I'll go and pray, but don't you deceive us by not letting the people go to sacrifice. So Moses went, he prayed, the flies went away, and not one fly remained. And then verse 32, Pharaoh says, no, he cannot go now. And no wonder the plagues keep piling up upon him. And uh, then come the fifth plague. And as this plague comes, you notice that uh, uh, it gets worse and worse. After the sixth plague, uh, Balls were all over the place, including Pharaoh. And, uh, and they still wouldn't let them go. Then uh, it says here, and uh, by the seventh plague, the hail, God says in chapter 9, verse 13, Rise early, he told Moses, stand before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord God of Hebrews, let my people go. Well, he's been telling them all the time. That they may serve me. For at this time, I will send all my plagues to your very heart. And God says how he will stretch out his hand and pestilence will come. And uh, <coughs> as yet it says, you exalt yourself against my people. In verse 17. And so came forth the hail. In verse 24. It struck all of Egypt except in the land of Goshen. Now at the time when the plague was coming, Pharaoh sent for Moses. See, he actually looks like, oh, he changed his mind again. In verse 27, he says, and this time he says, I have sinned. Hey, look, he did say, I think he looked like he repented. It would have been a good hallelujah, right? If only he really repented. He says, he was saying, I have sinned this time. You know, actually, it's more because he got so much loss. You know, one thing after the other, all dying, and now the pestilence. He really, his nation is impoverished. And then he even says, The Lord is righteous. My people and I are wicked. Hey, that sounds like the correct statement. He says, Entreat the Lord that there may be no more this thundering and hail. And then he says, Pharaoh says, I will let you go. And you shall stay no longer. And Moses said to him, As soon as I had gone out of the city, I will spread out my hands to the Lord. Thunder will cease, there will be no more hail. Then you will know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, 
I know that you will not yet fear the Lord. <coughs> and so, when he went forth, look at verse 34, Pharaoh saw the rain, the hail, the thunder stop. He seen yet more, he says. He hardened his heart and he wouldn't let the people go. So it was a ding-dong game. Uh, in chapter 10, God sent for Moses again. And uh, this time, uh, he says, If you refuse, in verse 4, locusts will come. Locusts will come and they will fill the whole land. Now this time in verse 7, Pharaoh's servants are panicking now. After all, you know, they have everything destroyed. Their crops, their cattle, everything is destroyed. And now, whatever left over, locusts are going to come. So Pharaoh's servant in verse 7 says to him, How long shall this man be a snare to us? Let them go, he says. Let the man go. That they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not know that Egypt is destroyed? It really was destroyed. And um, then, it looks like there's a bargaining process in verse 8. Moses and Aaron were brought again to Pharaoh. And he says, Go serve the Lord your God. Now, here's another time he's saying, go serve the Lord. Then he says, who are the ones that are going? And, uh, because remember, Pharaoh's servant says, um, let the men go. Keep the women and children here. See, slowly things were changing. But you notice a progressive revelation. And I'm sure as an Israelite, you think about it from an Egyptian point of view, as an Israelite, you know, things were getting interesting. That, they, they are getting a bit of knowledge more and more. Well, now, not only the mango is that, first go to feast, go to serve the Lord. The mango, now the children want to go, everyone go, looks like everyone is going out. And uh, so the information was filtering down to the people as to how much it was. And it was 9, Moses answered. Chapter 10, verse 9. We will go out with our young and our old, with our sons and with our daughters, with our flocks and our herds, and we will go, we must hold a feast to the Lord. Then he said to them, The Lord had better be with you when I let you and your little ones go. Beware, for evil is ahead of you. What wow, is Pharaoh really, eh? Talk the other way. And then Pharaoh says in verse 11, Not, not so. Go now, you who are men, and serve the Lord. For that is what you desire. And then they were driven from Pharaoh's presence because Pharaoh only let the men go. But he don't want to let anybody else go. God was not going to compromise. Now when you look at, look at that, Pharaoh represented the devil and the devil's people. You notice how they compromised a little bit? And this was a big issue. Imagine if it's a smaller issue, how much the devil's people will try to compromise and all that. God has no compromise. God was clear cut from the start what he wanted to do among the people. And the revelation was dribbling down to the people a bit at a time. The people would slowly begin to understand, okay, we got feast in God. And now if you were an Israelite, what would you be looking forward to? Yay, away from here. Yay, there's a feast. But you had no idea what God was going to do. Of all the things that God ever did, it was not bringing them out. <coughs> bringing them out was an easy thing. Even bringing them to the land of Canaan was an easy thing. <coughs> All natural. The hardest part was wanting to bring His presence into them. That was hidden from them. <coughs> and that was the key. Now, we see in chapter 10. Let's look on. <coughs> in chapter 10, the locusts came covered the land then verse 16 Pharaoh said again I have sinned <coughs> he always changing his mind I have sinned <coughs> against the Lord your God and against you <coughs> now therefore <coughs> please forgive my sin yet one more time well, this Pharaoh one more time he says 
and uh, <clears throat> entreat the Lord your God that He may take away all these things, these locusts and this death. <coughs> the Lord sent a strong west wind, took the locusts away, blew them into the Red Sea. Not one remained. But Pharaoh still didn't let the people go. And that's when Moses stretched out and there was a darkness in the land in verse 23 three days <coughs> three full days there had darkness no sunlight could get in in the end look at what Pharaoh did in verse 24 Pharaoh says to Moses okay <coughs> go and serve the Lord let your flocks and your herds be kept back let your little ones also go with you. See, he's trying to compromise. Say, okay, you know, little ones go, but I want to keep all your flocks, all your property leave behind. <coughs> Moses says, You must also give us sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Our livestock will go with us. And um, Pharaoh Say, away with you! Again, he didn't want. See, he's slowly giving in. But it was not satisfactory to God. And God wants long stop barrel. In the end, chapter 11, the final one. And God knew that this one would hit him right at the heart. Because Pharaoh has a firstborn too. <coughs> With the firstborn of every child and of all the animals were a sign to be killed as a judgment and uh, God knew everything and God prepared all of them all the people in chapter 12 that was where the Passover lamb was there and um, as we mentioned before uh, during this uh, last 10 plague uh, Shama in charge of all the angels descended with probably Tens of thousands, probably could be even hundreds of thousands of angels came down, each one with swords drawn, all ready. And when, when they landed, each one go to different places, a one stroke of the spiritual dimension sword, every firstborn died. They knew exactly where to go. They knew where all the firstborn animal and firstborn people are. But before it happened, God protected the Israelites with a Passover lamb, which represents Jesus, the blood. And God told them, the, the specific instructions that they were given was that they were put the, as you see in chapter 12, that uh, as they partake of all those things, among some of the instructions you'll find, that they were even to partake of it with the sandals all worn as if they're all ready to go off. And in need that night itself, they're all ready to travel. And as they were ready to travel, something that they, God never talked about. Maybe he talked about it to Moses. But not commonly known by the people, he might have revealed it here and there, was finally when they were going out, uh, on the day, as they marched forth, the Bible tells us in uh, chapter 14, uh, chapter 13, it says, verse 21. Chapter 13, verse 21. The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. That one was a surprise to the people. Pleasant surprise. Because all God said was, you're going to let the people go. They're going to be delivered. They're going to enter the land of Canaan. But this pillar of cloud was a pleasant surprise. And in fact, it was the main thing. This pillar of cloud, I believe is produced by one of those a first grouping of angels in charge of the presence of God. I believe that in that cloud, 
which is a supernatural cloud, and which was a, actually it was it had a certain type of fire. Except in daytime, it might see as a cloud, but in the nighttime, it was really brilliant, like a fire. The inside is most likely a cherubim. The same cherubim that is going to en- enter into the pres- bring the presence into the out of the covenant. And all the archangels and all those were already marching together out. And who was leading the way? The presence of God. This was what the people never anticipate. And the same in this revival. You know why? How long did it take for them to build the tabernacle of Moses? All the different parts. One year. It took them one year. You can see the measurement of the mention of uh, the first day of, uh, that it came out and then until the, the, the next year. is the, the first year, the first, uh, it's almost the same time the following year. Then they completed it. It took one year to build all the different parts of the tabernacle. It took King Solomon seven years to build the temple. It's going to take us about a year or so to build the spiritual parts of the temple of God. We are the New Testament tabernacle. We are the New Testament temple. God is interested to bring the Shekinah glory into His church. For 2,000 years, that glory has been manifested a bit here, a bit there, a bit here, a bit there. It was manifested in the book of Acts. It has to because it was the beginning. And you see the rushing of a mighty wind. You see the tongues of fire come on them in Acts 2. But then by Acts chapter 5, you saw the glory of God was so great that it says there was not a single poor person among them. And it might as well say there was also not a single sick person in their midst. It's almost like in the wilderness you read about how their shoes never wear out for 40 years in spite of them being extra time in the wilderness. And none of them, except for those under judgment, they died of the plague. You know, their, their, their food didn't swell up. But God was their healer and God was their provider. They had food every day in the morning manna, in the evening quails. And there's a lot of food that God provided for them. They had prosperity uh, uh, and all those, remember it was the curse of the law that they were redeemed from. And at that time, God was bringing them the blessings. And in the book of Acts, in Acts 5, it mentioned everyone was healed. Which means that not a sick, single sick person ever came to them and left without being healed. Look at Acts chapter 5 very carefully. When that degree of glory grew, now the Bible didn't tell us how suddenly it came. It only tells us about the sudden coming of the Holy Spirit. And that is different. That is in Acts 2. That was the Holy Spirit coming together with all the spirit beings working under the Holy Spirit. And as He filled them all with the Spirit, the glory was increasing. Until it, but what were they doing? They were spending time in prayer. They were fellowshipping. They were growing in the knowledge of God. And at some point in Acts chapter 4, persecution arose. And they prayed unto God. And uh, in their prayer, in verse 31, when they prayed, the place where they assembled was shaken. That was how great the manifestation of God's presence. But yet in Acts 5, the glory was growing more and more. And Ananias and Sapphira died because they didn't realize the presence of God was getting that strong. And uh, the Bible says that uh, there were signs and wonders that were done. The Bible says in chapter 5 verse 16, Acts 5 16, Multitudes come. The shadow of Peter passing by can heal a person. Up to this day in church history, we do not have shadow healing. We have handkerchief copied from Acts 19. Because shadow healing is very difficult. 
and and I believe that it could be a natural shadow or it could be the shadow cast by the glory of God that was there. And uh, but there was definitely glory there. And how do I know that there was uh, not a single sick person because in verse 16 is one of the few places that you ever see mentioned they were all healed. Up to this day in church history, there is never any faith healer or any healing service where they were all healed. A lot of healing, many healings, but never all healed. The only time it's recorded is in the ministry of Jesus and in this place here. So something is here. The glory of God. And uh, we also know that at this time, <laughs> from the revival that was, in chapter f- that was going on in chapter 4, it says here in chapter 4, um, verse uh, 32 to 34, the multitude of those who believe were of one heart, one soul, neither of did anyone say any of the things he possessed was his own. They had all things in common. With great power, the apostles gave witness uh, to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace, not just grace, great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. They got no more poverty. No more sickness. Hey, this is the glory of God in the church. And it took one year for them to build the tabernacle. And after they built the whole tabernacle, at the end of the book of Exodus, chapter 40, when Moses has put all the pieces in order as God wanted, it says in chapter 40, verse 34, you know the cloud that was always there? After they anointed the whole tabernacle, the cloud in verse 34 covered the tabernacle of meeting. It might have been some distance up in the sky. I thought it needed to be leading them from afar. But when Moses built the tabernacle, that cloud came right down to the, pla- to the planet Earth, right over the place where the mercy seat was. And inside that cloud, was the cherubim. See, we know it's the cherubim because when they build the ark, they build the cherubim wings looking at each other because they were in charge of carrying the presence of God. And as they build the cherubim that was there, the real cherubim descended in a cloud and the glory in verse 34 filled the whole tabernacle, the holy place, uh, the most holy place, the holy place, and even the outer court. The whole place was filled momentarily. And this also happened in the tabernacle, in the temple of Solomon. Just for a short time, as the glory just came. And it was 35. Moses cannot go in also. He couldn't because the presence of the cherubim was there. Because the cloud rested above it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now, we all know one thing. Ever since that day, the glory of God was inside the ark. And I asked Pastor David, what did he see when, when they entered the promised land? Did they have like, angels and all those? What the angels all fighting on it? He says, when they crossed the Jordan, Nothing new need to be done. The glory that was inside the ark that they that they carry as they step into the Jordan River, shoom, the, the Jordan was parted. 
they didn't need like Moses, you know, lift up his hands or or, or no, uh, Joshua lift up his javelin or whatever style, and then wait for the two spirit beings to come and blow on the thing and until. Uh, but no, the glory that was there inside the ark was the force that when it stepped into the water, shoom, the power just released. And we know what that ark can do. When David brought the ark into Jerusalem, the first time when he failed, he ended up in Obed-Edom's house. And you know, Obed-Edom, how blessed he was. No sickness, no poverty. Think about this glory that is coming. And it's a side effect of that tremendous presence of God. And put it this way, although Jesus counted us worthy and washed by His blood, we are made worthy and we can enter into the Holy of Holies as we are encouraged to do in Hebrews 4. But I don't think that we are ready for the cherubim of God to descend in our midst. Do you think you are ready? So you say, Hey, I'm ready! You know, like those, you, sound, you, you might sound like Peter in the Bible when Jesus says, all of you will betray me. All of you will be scattered. Not betray. All of you will be scattered. Not a single one of you will be around. And then Peter says, you know, I know, I I'll follow you. Even if to die, I'll die for you. Yeah, big mouth. When he was just questioned after Jesus was arrested, he denied that he was a disciple of Jesus. And so we might say, Yeah, I'm ready for the for the full cherubim glory. I'll tell you, that will, might be the last time you put up your hand. And then as the glory comes down, you look around. Hey, quite different place. <laughs> your body just died. You're not ready for the present. And then you can find you know, you're, the saints are overcoming you home. <laughs> One guy say, what well, home? No, this is now heaven. <laughs> and this is the part that I believe God is preparing us for. That, think about it, even in a logical sense, we have a greater covenant. If in the old covenant, even the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3 tells us this, that, the glory of this new covenant is supposed to be greater than the glory that was in Moses' time. And if in the old covenant, God manifests that glory in Moses' tabernacle, and God manifests that glory in Solomon's temple, how come we, the church, have not tasted of that Glory as carried by the first order of angels. The one in charge of God's presence. Because God reserved it. He manifests a little bit in the book of Acts to show us. But God reserved it until the church has reached its fullness. And I give you supporting verses to prove that it is going to happen and it will happen, and it must happen, if the Word is the Word of God. And that is what this revival is about. That's why it's taking us time. In the book of Ephesians chapter 1, <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, at the end of it, he says, about the church in verse 22 23 and he put all things under his feet and gave him that is Jesus to be head over all things to the church and what is the church he says which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all we haven't reached even that part yet. That's our destiny. 
And many times when you read about heavenly places and principality and power, people always think there is a negative side. Yes, the neg negative side is mentioned in chapter 6. But there is also the positive side. And it says there is heavenly places where we are in heavenly places in chapter 2. And uh, <coughs> Numbers 21. Far above all principality, power, there is exousia actually, mind, dominion, which is curiates, and every name that is named not in this age, but also in that which is to come. Now when you say in that age which is to come, guaranteed not talking about the devil. Because in the next age to come, it's already burning in a lake of fire. We are talking about this thrones, powers, and dominion all coming together to serve God under the presence of God. The greatest thing that God will ever do in a church is to bring His presence. Not just a taste of His presence, but His Shekinah glory presence. And in chapter 2, Verse um, 20 to 22. Having been built, now it's not built properly at the moment. Because throughout all of church history, you don't always see, only in the last uh, 100 to 200 years, have we become more emphasi emphasizing on the fivefold ministries. In the early days, yes. And the church was founded. They knew apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Somewhere in between, it all got lost. Dark ages, all forgotten. And uh, people even today might not even believe that prophets can exist in the New Testament. Although it's in your Bible, Agabus the prophet and all that. And, but towards the end time, God's going to bring all things in order. And He says, Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So why do you think God combined prophets and apostles together? Because we are supposed to help build the church for this one reason. Verse 21. For well, the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple. Now if you ever call the church a holy temple, it has to be a greater holy temple than the tabernacle of Moses, which was the law. Grace is greater than law. It has to be a greater temple than Solomon's temple because that temple was just a physical temple. But this temple is a temple built from human lives. And what is our destiny? In whom you are also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And God's dwelling place upon our lives is for one purpose. To put His presence in our lives greater than the presence that was ever in the Old Covenant. That's why in this revival, by the time the presence of God shows up, it is going to continue and continue and continue. A lot of things are going to take place that's never taken place before. And I'm not talking about just revival presence. From time to time, people like Charlie Finney talk about the taste of God's presence, talk about visions of Jesus and all those. We are talking about Shekinah glory coming into the church. Now, don't you think that before God do does that, He's going to prepare us for that? Now you know why He says it takes one year, two years. And why it has to be announced throughout all the earth? Because once the presence comes, at His appointed time, it will spread throughout the whole planet. Because somehow, the church is now spread throughout all the five continents of the whole earth. How it will be coordinated, I don't have all the details. How it will happen, we can only have a glimpse. When it will take place, God knows the perfect time. But one thing we know, that the archangels are working with us, 
Michael and Gabriel, all the archangels, and all the spirit beings that are be waiting to be released in the second phase of the revival, where, where tremendous signs and wonders are done, and then the, the first order of the, of the angelic beings in charge of the presence of God, it is so that all of them together will be manifested. That is why uh, Jacob's uh, ladder, or what he saw, is more staircase, it was all the way up, seeing all the various levels of, of spirit beings and angels, and it will be like an open heaven on the earth, and that happens. Where all the nine categories, from the earth to the holy of holies in heaven, is a connection made by the church of Jesus Christ. And you and I are part of the church. And this is the grand vision of what our destiny is. So let's push hard in that, pray into that, and yield to the Spirit to take us a step at a time. Only He knows all the little, little details that we need to move into. I know some of those details, and one of those things is, up in the Holy of Holies in heaven, holiness is super important. And you can imagine if that same presence is to be down here, how much holiness it does it require of us? So that's why it's taking us time to prepare, to build. Some of us will be anointed in different things. Just like when uh, Moses' tabernacle was being built, the Spirit filled uh, Aholiah and Bezalel. And under them, he filled all the skilled craftsmen. And they did all those things. Whatever they did symbolically will be like the group of people who will be building in the spirit in one dimension. And then there will be the women, the people who sow, all those things. There will be spiritually be another group of people preparing those areas. And then there will be, of course, the priests and... Uh, and Aaron and then Moses, they represent the fivefold, threefold in those days. And, uh, and they will do their own part and prepare. Make sure everything is according to the order, the pattern that the Lord has. And then in the final thing, when everything finished, Moses had to put everything together. And when everything is... Remember, everything must be finished first. And it could be lying all over the place. But as it's finished, he has to arrange everything bit by bit. And as he arranged everything in order, and then he has to anoint, and there's a ceremony that he went about, and he anoint, then only the cherubim came in the cloud of glory. The same process is going to take place in our lives over this one year to two years. Be prepared for what the Holy Spirit instructs. Be prepared for what the angels instruct. Already, the spiritual word has gone out. Only today, uh, I received another email. I received hundreds of emails. I received another email from, from um, uh, one of those who used to be in my old uh, church in uh, Malaysia, and they're from Indonesia. And uh, she's one of those, uh, 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 I always call them the kind, lovely little ladies, you know, and uh, quite well off lady in Indonesia who always flies to Malaysia, stays two, three weeks, and then go back to Indonesia to and fro. So she is quite a regular member of our church. Uh, in KL. And she says, uh, she saw me in a dream. And in the dream, I was, you know, talking to her about the coming of the Lord. And the day after she got the dream, her sister all the way from US rang her and says, she just found my website and ministry, asked her whether she knows about me. And these are the work of angels. The word is already going out in the spirit. And we all have our little part to do. If you fast when the Lord leads you, if you pray when the Lord leads you, of course keep confessing the word too, if you do your little part that the Lord leads you, you are like one of those people making the garments that God has made. Or the craftsman doing the part that God has. And uh, uh, each one doing our part, and then one day everything will be fitted together and the glory of God will come. The glory that, that 2,000 years of church history has been waiting for. The glory that many of our predecessors have been talking about. 
the glory that great men and women of God have been talking about, it is coming. And it's already begun in our hearts. And let's continue to flow in that. Praise God.